I would like to welcome the GCC delegation for their week in Washington, and we hope to see you every year. I understand this is now going to be an annual uh, visit by the GCC delegation, so we welcome you today at AGSIW. We have a great panel, and I would like to welcome each and every one of them. Ahsan Ali Buhulega, uh, Fahd al Kawari, Omar al Abedli, welcome to the panel. We look forward to your remarks. And Karen Young, our very own AGSIW senior scholar, will moderate. And I'm going to turn it over to Karen to do the proper introductions of the panel. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marcel. And, and welcome, everyone. And welcome to our panelists. Um, just a note on our uh, panel etiquette. Would you please turn off your telephones or put them on silent? Um, we are live streaming the event, um, so you can watch it on Periscope. And the remarks are obviously then on the record. I'm going to do a bit of a, a show off of one of the tools that we've developed before I introduce the panelists, just to um, emphasize the real changes that are going on across the region right now in terms of um, uh, economic reform policies and initiatives. Um, this is a period of, of transition and a period in which there's a lot of uncertainty uh, for Gulf citizens and residents alike about what changes will be happening in terms of um, the government's history and, and real trajectory of, of being a redistributive state within each of the six GCC states. Um, and the nature of that relationship is, is transforming right now. Um, each of the six GCC states were facing fiscal deficits in 2016 with different measures of severity. Of course, when we put this in the context of the larger economies of, of the world, they're, they're still quite small. Um, but this has been a change when we think about the last 15 years of uh, the trajectory of growth of the Gulf states, where they ex experienced a period of, of tremendous um, accumulation of wealth, which they directed towards um, infrastructure development and um, really expanding the nature of, of the state and its capacity um, within uh, a number of different sectors. Um, but that time is, is really sort of an anomaly and, and not where we see ourselves now and not where we see ourselves going in the near future because, of, of course, the price of oil is lower and the availability of oil, the supply of oil, is much, much greater um, because of the development of, of shale oil technologies and the reduction in demand from key consumers in Asia. So what this means is that governments are going to have to make different kinds of choices, of course, about the resources that they have, how they get them. Um, it won't just be oil, so diversifying the economies away from oil. Um, and then about how they might generate revenue from uh, domestic uh, sources, either through private sector or through changing the way that they have um, traditionally given more to citizens rather than expected more from them. Um, so we've developed this tool called the Gulf Economic Barometer, and I hope you'll all try to <coughs> use it, and I'm going to give you just a short kind of preview. So we have a timeline where you can search by country or you can search by all six states at the same time. And then you can also search by policy measures. And we've divided these into um, fiscal policy and monetary policy measures. So obviously, we've been looking a lot at um, debt issuance across the, uh, the Gulf in the last year and a half. Um, and it's really been tremendous. Of course, Saudi Arabia has been going to debt markets very frequently. Um, and probably this year, expectations are around the $50 billion mark, which is, which is tremendous. Um, and this has been somewhat unusual, of course, for, for these states over the last 10 years, with the exception of Qatar, which tapped international debt markets in 2009 and in 2011, and the UAE to a smaller uh, amount. So if you have the time or the interest, I would highly recommend that you use this tool and let us know if you think we have uh, omitted something that's important. Let me get now to our panelists and give them a proper introduction. You don't need to hear more from me. Um, I'll start uh, to my far right is Dr. Omar Abadli, who is uh, luckily a non-resident fellow here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. So we have worked with Omar a lot in the past and, and um, are really grateful for that. But he's also in his full-time role, Program Director for International and Geopolitical Studies at the Bahrain Center for Strategic International and Energy Studies, also known as DARASAT. He's an affiliated associate professor of economics at George Mason University here in the area. Um, in the middle, we have Fahad al-Khawari, who is a senior energy policy analyst at the Ministry of Energy in Qatar. 
Um, he has been a fellow at OPEC and a short-term analyst and floor trader at Total. So he's going to give us uh, more of the uh, energy sector and, of course, from the gas industry in Qatar, what's going on. And to my immediate right is Dr. Isan Ali Buhalega, who is um, a very, very knowledgeable person on um, on industrial policy and the initiative of reforms, which are not new to the Gulf, right? So we've been doing five-year plans. We've been doing diversification efforts for some time. He's the founder of Juatha Consulting in Riyadh. He also was a member of the Saudi Shura Council for three consecutive terms and was the chairman of the Shura Finance Committee. He served three terms as a member of the Consultative Council for the GCC Supreme Council and he was Secretary General of the Gulf Organization for Industrial Consulting based in Doha in the 1990s. So really seeing a 30-year trajectory um, of diversification efforts and industrial policy planning within the Gulf states. So I've told the panelists that I'd, I'd like to organize our conversation today, um, starting with kind of a brief um, kind of uh, rapid-fire exchange. I want to give them all each uh, two minutes to tell us what they see as the single key obstacle to economic reform in the Gulf and the single best opportunity. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go into a more in-depth questioning with each of them um, one at a time. So Dr. Isan, would you mind if we started with you? This worst case, uh, worst thing that we have and best case uh, as well. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. I'm extremely uh, happy to be here with this uh, fantastic crowd. Thank you very much for the introduction. The, uh, I think the, 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 the real challenge now is to walk the talk. And uh, on all GCC, you'll see that we have uh, visions, the six of them, uh, different uh, uh, horizons, time horizons, but still very challenging, with different also orientations. So you imagine that the six GCC states will align their, uh, their visions, but until now this uh, did not happen. But this is very interesting time because we are really challenging ourselves. You see, uh, it, it seems at least, say, a country like Saudi Arabia, we have to have a mark between, say, last year and the, fut and the future years. Uh, in all indicators, including some of the, the, the ones that you mentioned. But uh, all in all, in the GCC, uh, we cannot escape uh, to do a number of things. We have to uh, maintain growth, and that growth needs to be steady and sustainable. We have to employ our own people, so it's not at all uh, acceptable to have high unemployment. And we have to diversify the economy uh, away from oil, not meaning not to do away with oil, but not the, the oil, not to, to continue with oil calling the shots uh, for the economic uh, performance of the six GCC states. Uh, finally, the challenge for these economic, fantastic, and very promising uh, economic reforms is to improve the economic uh, climate or the investment climate uh, in all GCC and to have more coordination within, within the group. Because right now you can see that there is a, a very clear element of competition. You know, everyone is trying to get the business first. Thank you. Uh, Fahad, do you want to give us the single key obstacle, single best opportunity for reform in the Gulf states? So um, thanks you. Th first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I look forward to this discussion. The, the biggest challenge we face is that we depend on a commodity. And the commodity happens to come from a very volatile, it's a very volatile commodity and the market is extremely volatile. Uh, I have a few correlation statistics here. If you look at uh, Qatar, when I say petroleum, I mean petroleum in the, in the form of all oil hydrocarbons, gas, yeah. oil and gas, petrochemicals included. Uh, if you look at <coughs> the correlation of GDP growth with uh, the price of oil, Qatar is only at 11%. So there's, there's barely a correlation, but if you look at it in gas, you're almost at 70%. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, please feel free to correct me, uh, Dr. Hassan, it's, it's around 80%. So we are, we are dependent on a commodity that we don't control. We, we did at one point, but we don't anymore. OPEC, which is, of course, uh, uh, more than the GCC, there's only four members of the GCC, only controls 30% of the market, and this is 13 large producers. So, so as Dr. Hassan <coughs> said, we have to diversify our economies and uh, 
release ourselves from these shackles that we're tied to uh, with regards to oil. Uh, the best way to do so is, uh, from a Qatari's perspective, is education. You educate your own people so that they are competitive not internally, they're competitive on a global basis. Uh, the best way to diversify an economy in, in Qatar's view is that. Thank you. Omar? <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, thank you for inviting me to participate today. I would say that the single my key obstacle is that people, and by people I mean both citizens and policy makers, failing to realize or refusing to acknowledge, or some combination, that the previous configuration of policies is not available. Um, uh, and therefore insisting on what I'd call NIMBY policies. Everybody refuses a reform and wants to go back to the previous state and, and doesn't realize that the previous state is no longer possible. Um, uh, so really, when somebody rejects a reform, they should be re proposing an alternative reform, not just saying, no, don't touch my public sector salary, don't touch my, uh, don't touch my, don't deregulate, I want everything the way it was, um, uh, don't, I don't want performance measures. It has to be, it has to be an, a counter proposal in terms of a reform, not just keep things as they were, because keeping things as they were is not an option. Uh, in terms of the best opportunity, I would say it's religious tourism in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, e, you know, the, the basics of, uh, of trade and growth are comparative advantage. And the one area where the GCC, or Saudi in particular, has an unassailable comparative advantage that will not be eroded over time by competition is in religious tourism, particularly yani, everything relating to Mecca and Medina al Munawwara. Uh, uh, and there are, there, it is. Uh, the, the, the potential is huge and the current, at least up until the last year, current efforts are very small compared to what can be achieved. I'm, I'm sure I speak for many other GCC citizens when I say I've never seen an advertisement saying come, and, come to Saudi for Umrah apart from the ones from the travel agents who are local. I've never seen a Saudi ministry of you know, tourism or whatever making an effort at convincing me to come to Umrah. It's always my decision to go. Um, and that's just one example of many, many, many different things. There are so many undeveloped religious sites in, in, in Saudi, yeah, and as I say, the, the, none of these will be uh, lost over time from competition from China. Or, or This is something that is completely fortified uh, 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 and, and is waiting to be uh, exploited in a, of course, religiously tasteful way. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Omar wrote a piece about this recently for us at HSIW in, in, the, in Bahrain, actually. Uh, so tourism would not necessarily be limited, I guess, in your estimation to, uh, to just Saudi, but, uh, but tourism of many kinds in many places. All right, we're going to give now a little bit more time for discussion to each of the panelists. I'm going to go back to Dr. Isan again, um, and I'd really like to drill down a bit into the question of developing um, a more active private sector in the Gulf, particularly in the Saudi case, and what, what this means where it is now, um, and it's obviously very nascent. It's obviously the state has played a very uh, redistributive role, but also kind of a predatory role um, in that any kind of good business has been um, taken up by the state itself. So how do you allow a private sector to flourish uh, without making it compete with state-related entities or um, entities that might, be have, uh, might have part ownership by um, state interest? So how do we grow the private sector um, what are opportunities or availability, increasing availability of financial products um, for new companies? I know there's a new secondary equity market being developed in Saudi Arabia, which is very exciting. Um, you've done a lot of this kind of planning work in terms of industrial policy. Um, how do you imagine firms coming into those difficult sectors, the mining sector, of course, the oil and gas services sector, and competing with the very established um, family firms and government firms that exist? Um, and then I wanted to press you a little bit on um, the softening of Vision 2030 we've seen over the last week. Um, how do we interpret this in terms of uh, the market interpretation of um, the government's commitment to the reform agenda? It's a lot to tackle. You choose right. where you start. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, very, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, you see, when we're talking about reform. Uh, no one says that reforms will uh, will uh, not include the private sector. It seems to me uh, that is a national priority and a GCC priority. I will tell you a story, a very short one. Uh, I was involved in a, in a study, and part of that study was a survey. 
uh, and we interviewed uh, the top echelon of, of management, either the chairman or the CEO of the company. And it was with, uh, with foreign investment, uh, so non-Saudi, pure Saudi ownership, but, uh, you know, either 100% foreign <coughs> ownership or uh, Saudi foreign. Uh, and uh, the, the key team was interviewing. So I got my, you know, my share of the interviews as well, and uh, it happened that I'm interviewing this uh, uh, multinational uh, Japanese executive in his uh, office in Riyadh. <sighs> that was last year, and then uh, before, uh, you know, going into the, uh, the, the, that business of, of interviewing him, he said, listen, I would like to have a cup of coffee with you. 10 minutes. I said, sure. And he said, I will talk with you about Vision 2030. I said, sure. And then, in short, he said, listen, under me, I manage six companies, affiliates, and I'm responsible for the Middle Eastern area. And since the announcement of Vision 2030 by Saudi Arabia, I've been visiting Ria, uh, Tokyo minimum once monthly to confer what to do. And he said, okay. I told him, okay, so what's the uh, verdict? He said, we, are, we realized that we need to change uh, the way we deal with Saudi Arabia. So it's not procurement anymore. It's partnership. Mm -hmm. See, the Japanese <coughs> took the matter seriously, okay? And he said, we are shifting gears. Okay, so we'll go to your government and say, okay, so if you have a power station, we will uh, uh, not, you know, talk to you anymore about building cars, uh, power station as contractors, but we will participate. Some of our uh, private sector did not get the message until this moment. Not because uh, that they, uh, they, 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 they are not smart or no, but it seems to me that some of them are still in denial that, th it w that things will not be enforced uh, to the extent that they'll happen as they are being you know, publicized. But look at the Japanese and many others, okay, uh, doing that. Last week, Mrs. Merkel was visiting Saudi Arabia and as the brand said, she was dwelling with him over the, 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 uh, the tenure of the CR. She said, we need five years, okay? Not one year. <coughs> so I think the private sector uh, need to be uh, also, uh, uh, need to do its share of reforms. Uh, in my estimation, the private sector, all in all, including Saudi Arabia in our region, is a family business is a big family business, <coughs> meaning that when you have the small and medium, the, uh, in Saudi Arabia is about 25% contribution to the GDP. You look at all OECD uh, uh, area and you see it's uh, above north of 70%. In certain countries, it's even 98, 99% <coughs> of the G20. So we need to do something there. Plus, the, the, the uh, uh, linkages between the small and medium and the large almost not there. So here, for example, in the United States, you talk about, say, car manufacturing, and you'll see like a, a network, or a tree at least. The there, no. What you have, yeah. you have a family business, so, and this family business owns, like, say, everything that it needs, mm -hmm. okay, from procurement to trading to manufacturing to uh, what have you, catering. So what you have, you have, it's, it's an inside job. So I think that needs to end. Plus, in... in in uh, Saudi Arabia, this is the first time I see this level of commitment. So it wasn't only a piece done by, say, a consultant. Okay, Vision 2030. It wasn't done by a consultant, to tell you. And I have very strong ties with McKinsey their number one man in the, in, in, who is responsible for the whole Middle East told me, Hassan, we did not do it. I said Hassan with an Egyptian dial uh, pronunciation. Okay, <coughs> so 
the, this level of commitment being reiterated in the royal visits in the various provinces of Saudi Arabia. And, for example, in his visit to the eastern province, the king allotted 50% of his time during like addressing the people, talking about 2030. And every uh, state visit in, from China to, uh, to, uh, to Japan to other, all, all, same thing happened. Uh, when it comes to the private sector, the issue that we have a structural change for their contribution, not only to the, to the economy or to, to the GDP, but also to the treasury. Imagine the size GDP-wise of the private sector, Saudi private sector, is one trillion Saudi rials which is 40% of the 2.45 trillion, which is the GDP, the whole GDP of Saudi Arabia. 40%. The zakah is about 14.5 uh, billion. The income tax is about 15 billion. That's about 29.5 billion. This is the whole contribution of the private sector, Saudi and Saudi foreign all, about like, so which is very low in comparison, like 30, Billion in comparison to uh, to, uh, to to add, this is in comparison to OECD or even to the G20. So there there need to be a link where the private sector is not only uh, moving from procurement to to partnership, but also to really uh, look at how it can add more to the to the economy as a whole. And it's in the case of Saudi Arabia, adding to the economy, that means employing more <coughs> Saudis. And how to do that? By, by stating that the, the issue now with the private sector, the government, from the government perspective, with the private sector is a local content issue. Can I stop you there? I want to press on this a little bit, and then we'll move on to our other two panelists. But it seems to me you've, I mean, you've made a very nice point that it's partnership, not procurement. Yes, that makes absolute sense. But when I speak to business people in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, they tell me, this is a wait-and-see period. We're nervous to make investment. Uh, we don't really know what's coming next. So there's, there's a bit of a holding uh, period happening, which you can't really blame the private sector for that. So if you're, you're making a big ask for them, right? Um, but at the same time, there's reasons why they're hesitant. There's reasons why they're hesitant to get into uh, providing services to large firms which might be government linked. There's, re there's reasons why they don't have the ability to grow, right? So why, well, the reason why I asked about the availability of financial products is, is this, you know, it, it takes money to make money, right? And so if, if you're going to build a private business in Saudi Arabia, do you know that you are safe to do so in the protection of that investment? Do you have the access to capital to do it? Um, and what makes people comfortable. So I wonder if, if you would give any kind of explanation for, you know, there's a reason why the foreign firms are jumping in, the German firms, the Japanese, the South Korean, and making very good joint ventures, the very, moving forward a lot on new public-private partnerships, especially in the renewable energy sector, um, but why we don't see more competitive Saudi firms doing this. There's, there's one in that sector that's doing well, Aqua Power, right? But what are, what are others, and, and what's, what's the impediment? I think uh, this is a very interesting point. And uh, I thought uh, I answered that, or I, I covered that point, uh, or tackled that point very briefly uh, mm -hmm. in my uh, previous interjection by saying uh, the private sector is still in denial in my esti estimation. They think it will not happen. But it's they happening. think the reforms won't happen. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's happening. The thing, the thing is that they need to restructure. You see, meaning what you have, you have right now, we have Vision 2030. And what you need to do as a business, also in my estimation, you need to transform yourself, restructure yourself, so you can benefit from the, from the opportunities that the Vision 2030 will bring along. Uh, please please uh, bear in mind that the Vision last year announced two programs, mm -hmm. the National Transformation Program and the uh, Fiscal Balance Program. You can consider have. these two programs as like housekeeping, mm -hmm. that the government would like to be more efficient and more careful with the money and to tackle the deficit, which is one, 100 uh, billion uh, uh, US dollars, and you have to, to manage that. 
And uh, the, but if you look at the, the other 10 programs that were announced on Sunday, all of them are economic bar excellence. The, the, the basic idea to generate opportunities to the private sector, investment opportunities, to generate uh, business uh, uh, employment opportunities for our young, uh, young kids, okay, and to diversify, by that, diversifying the economy. But also the government is saying the following. We know that it's, things are changing. We know that it is tough, as you mentioned, okay? And that's why we have the uh, BIF, the Public Investment Fund, mm -hmm. to, to invest. So it will co-invest. It will invest more than 50% of the money that it'll have internally. Okay, this is, by the, the, this is their strategy that was announced yeah. also last year. So I think the, that transformation effort, the government is saying we are not deserting you, but now we are changing the, the, the orientation. Rather than it's a contracting relationship, we will co-invest and we will, uh, for example, now the latest plan, this is my last sentence, uh, Al Gidea, for example. Gidea is an, uh, an intermain, an entertainment city. Okay, and the government said, okay, we own this land, okay, so we are making it available for, for this. We will provide the infrastructure with all services necessary. This is also we will invest, and then it will be available to businesses too, mm -hmm. and we will tell you that we have deficit in that, in, in ledger and other services, so come and invest. So, you know, early, early on, that wasn't the, 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 the idea. Early on, for example, we have we have an experience in Thumama, uh, also park, uh, in the outskirts of, of Riyadh. It did not succeed just because of that, the developmental issue and the infrastructure issue. At, the, at that point in time, the government said, no, we are not investing in, in the infrastructure. If you think it's good enough of opportunity, you, the private it's sector, like do, do that. Yeah. That's a very good example. All right, thank you for that. And I, I thank you all for your patience for me to press that point a little bit. I want to go to Omar and speak more about um, labor market dynamics and, and labor policy. So, you know, one of the big priorities of the economic reform agenda is to um, right this imbalance in terms of where people, uh, GCC citizens, work. And of course, the preponderance of them work in the public sector. Um, so, Omar, if you could just give us a little bit of a picture of, of labor market reform efforts um, in Bahrain and maybe a comparative assessment across the GCC um, and these efforts to um, nationalize economies in terms of the, the demographics of, of labor. <coughs> so um, the GCC labor markets are uh, compared to the they're very different to the rest of the world and they, they're quite homogenous among themselves. But there are differences in terms of the reforms introduced because the different countries have different goals. Um, some, of them are sh some of the goals are shared, so that it's to improve the skills of nationals as part of a transition to a knowledge economy. That's something shared in all the visions. They want to create better links between educational outputs and the private sector's needs. Uh, uh, they want to get people out of the public sector into the private sector. These are all common points and to create job opportunities for nationals. One thing that's slightly different among the countries uh, and applies more to Bahrain is there's a desire to generate revenues from... Uh, so charging fees and taxes on, on the foreign workers is not just a, a way of potentially reforming the market to make it more attractive for nationals. It's also an effort to generate some... to relieve fiscal pressure. Um, and finally, another one that's a little bit more specific to Bahrain is there's a, there's a desire to tackle labor market irregularities. So there's, a, there's something called the free visa problem in Bahrain. It exists in, in all the GCC countries, more or less. Um, but Bahrain's been relatively proactive in, in trying to address it. And just very briefly, for those who are not familiar with it, with the free visa problem, what you have is um, people coming in to the country on regular work visas, but then doing a job that is not what their visa is for, uh, and they're sort of operating in some sort of black economy. Um, uh, and that creates various uh, uh, problems for the people themselves, for the people who purchase their services, and for the government. Um, what are the reforms that have been undertaken to achieve these goals? Uh, public sector hiring and pay freezes, or as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, maybe there's been a bit of a reversal uh, uh, it's not clear how temporary that is, the reversal. But anyway, there's been public sector hiring and pay freezes um, to various degrees across the GCC states. There's higher fees on foreign workers and, and tighter <coughs> enforcement as well. I, 
Uh, I visit Saudi Arabia a lot, and it's definitely the case that uh, that you know, based on casual observation, uh, even in Bahrain, there's a much more stringent uh, uh, crackdown on on you know uh, undocumented uh, w uh, workers and and that kind of thing. Uh, recently, we saw in Saudi Arabia reserving certain jobs for citizens. I think there was a, 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 a a rule, a new law that says that all Saudi malls have to uh, employ exclusively citizens. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to be implemented, that, uh, but at least the desire, the desire is there. Um, uh, and then in, in the Bahrain case, uh, there's this uh, new policy, uh, uh, which is self-sponsorship. So the existing system for uh, migration in the GCC is what's called the kafala system. Uh, and the way that works is, so it's the, the, the kafala system is designed to make it very easy for migrant workers to enter and work in, in the country. Um, and the reason that kafala system exists is because for many years, there was, and still today, there's a big need for large numbers of migrant workers across all components of the skill spectrum. If you try to do something as complicated as what you have in the H-1B system in America, where you have to do all sorts of checks and processes and paperwork and et cetera, et cetera, the, the economies would be growing a lot more slowly than they have done in the last 30 years. So the rule, the kafala system is about how can I make it very easy for people to bring in migrant workers to, uh, you know, to supplement the existing workforce uh, for business and, and, and residential needs. Um, this created uh, or this contributed to, to some of the labor market irregularities like the fee of visa problem that I mentioned. Um, you can try and tackle that in different ways. Temporary measures include things like amnesties, uh, but it's trying to, to try to solve it in a sort of more long-term way while generating as well some revenue to relieve fiscal pressure. Bahrain's tried this new thing, which is that rather than having the uh, uh, a domestic or a citizen or a, bus or a domestic business sponsor the, the migrant worker, having the migrant worker pay uh, to have the, and self-sponsor and be able to come in and work. Um, it only just started, uh, and it's too early to judge this, um, but it's actually, uh, uh, in principle, a very humane way uh, of, of tackling the prevailing irregularities um, uh, in a way that tries to take into account uh, the, you know, the interests of many different stakeholders. And I'm sure that all the other GCC countries are looking at what's going to happen in the Bahrain when they try this, because all the GCC countries want to try you know, and decrease labor market irregularities. I know the UAE f has been very interested in, it has been experimenting with different policies to try to decrease these kind of irregularities in their own market. And all the different economies are trying different things. And I'm sure three or four years from now, we'll see you know, some sort of uh, uh, optimal mix being applied in the countries based on how these different policies work out. Um, and as a general comment, I think uh, in the Bahrain case and in all the GCC countries, the biggest gains um, and the biggest distortion that exists in the labor market and, and the one that's in most need of, of reform is, is public sector salaries. Uh, the, the problem that public, so when, when the GCC countries became independent, um, they created public sector jobs um, which they reserved for the most part for nationals, uh, and they gave salaries which were way, way beyond the productivity, what, what could be justified based on the productivity of the person working. This happened for many reasons. Probably the most important reason for this is that the governments wanted to create, you know, comfortable lives for the citizens, and what could be better than having a, a secure job with limited working hours and, and super high pay. The problem with this um, is that it makes trying to run a business very, very difficult because you're trying to, if you, if, you, if you want to employ a national, you're competing with wages which are completely uncommensurate with, uh, with productivity. When you're trying, when, you know, com competition forces you to have to give people wages in com that, are, that, are, that match their productivity. Um, so if you want the private sector in the long run to be viable, to be, you know, a source of innovation, a source of dynamism, then the biggest boost you could possibly give the private sector is having a much smaller percentage of the population working in the public sector and having them work for, you know, much lower wages. <coughs> I've lived in many different countries and, uh, you know, in most countries, most Western advanced economies, nobody ever took a job in the public sector because of the pay. People take jobs in the public sector because it gives maybe good security, maybe relatively low hours, but I never heard anyone say, oh, I'm working in the you know, Department of Commerce because the salaries are great, or I'm working in you know Department of Agriculture because it's got you know great benefits. 
Uh, that's what needs to be the case in the GCC countries if they want the uh, uh, private sector to be able to create job opportunities for the, uh, for the nationals and to have the private sector be able to be dynamic and, uh, and respond to uh, uh, global markets. But is this realistic, Omar? I mean, the attempts to cut public sector salaries, as we saw in Saudi Arabia over the last week, have not been sustained. Um, and we've seen some efforts in other, um, other states through the, the Nitikat program, the Emiratization program, the, you know, these, these state-manded efforts to get uh, citizens out of the public sector. And I don't think we're seeing large success there. Um, I mean, what, what policies could be different, and are there comparable policies? I mean, do you think it's, it's relevant to look at affirmative action policies in the U.S. as a, a comparable kind of um, employment mandate? What works? So, first of all, just, you know, by, because of inflation, if you just have pay freezes uh, and you decrease allowances, over three, four years, that makes a big difference. You know, if you just have three or four, so basically then you're decreasing the real wage by three or four percent every year. Over five, six years, that's actually, that turns into quite, by compounding that, turn, that alone, which is not something that's too difficult to implement, politically speaking. And then, and also not, re, not hiring to, re, not, you know, having very limited hiring to replace the people that are going out. That, in terms of compounding, has a significant effect. Uh, furloughs are an option as well, especially voluntary furloughs. I know that was used in California when they had a fiscal crunch uh, in the, uh, a couple of years ago, where, you know, you could ask people to work. 20% less for for 20% of the wage for 20 cent less wages or some some sort of comparable calculations. So I think you can do a lot without having to do something like actually lay people off or close things out. I mean, there's a lot of just by virtue of uh, uh, organic inflation, you can exploit uh, pay freezes. In terms of your question about affirmative action, I think that basically all you know when it comes to labour market, if you if you want to improve the attractiveness uh, uh, of certain groups in the population, such as citizens or whatever. A key lesson from the history of the global economy, which includes things like affirmative action programs, is that the best way to make people more attractive is to actually uh, uh, enhance their productivity. And this goes back to the, uh, you know, the point um, uh, Fahad made earlier on about education. Um, if, if, if directing investment towards better education, and this is a, this is a long-term thing, this is not something where you'll get quick returns. Uh, but having uh, much better education and, and performance uh, uh, measures in education is going to give you far better return um, uh, than, than fiddling around with, uh, you know, affirmative action analogs or, you know, legislating to try and get people. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you go to the poorest countries in the world that have become rich or that are becoming richer, or if you look at the countries that are now rich, how did they become rich? The way people got jobs and the way people uh, 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 became more productive is by them gaining better skills and having uh, 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 a less regulated uh, uh, and more empowered private sector. And that goes back to having less resources controlled by the government, which starts with less public sector employment. Thank you, Omar. I'm going to move to Fahad uh, al Khwari now, and uh, he does have a slide for us. So let me see if I can get that going for you. Um, Fahad, I. I would like it if you would tell us, I mean, f from the Qatari perspective, which is obviously highly dependent on um, gas revenues for government, government expenditure and has a little bit different of an employment issue, not so much pressure, um, uh, smaller, very much smaller national population um, to place them. And the Qatari case is also interesting because they're, they've got less pressure from a deficit than some of the neighbors. Um, and there is some difference in that the reform agenda in terms of um, restructuring government entities and decreasing um, some of the more uh, ambitious projects in education and, and, um, and even in infrastructure building have started to be cut before the decline in, um, in hydrocarbon prices um, with the transition um, to power to Sheikh Tamim. So I wonder if you could just give us the, a picture of how Qatar sits relative to its neighbors in the economic reform um, agenda, what pressures they face that are different, um, and specific to the energy sector, I mean, is there really a lot that's going to change? Um, first of all, we have to know that, uh, would you actually, would you like me to present the slide now? or It's up to it's you. It's just a very short. Up to you. And, uh, well, let me answer your question so that we can uh, keep this flowing. The, 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 the prices, the price fall of 2014 was not a surprise to anyone that works in the sector. What was a surprise is the extent. 
right? So we saw we saw 65 percent drop in, in prices, which is which is uh, of course significant. Uh, so uh, we knew that the prices were going to fall, and with the shift in leadership that happened in Qatar, we had a new, young, very energetic, vibrant leader that that understood that reform had to be uh, in place regardless of price, because we were becoming heavy and there was a lot of fat that had to be cut in government. Uh, if I may touch on uh, Omar's point, the, the issue of productivity and, and private and public sector wages in the Gulf is an issue that we all share as Gulf countries because of the huge elephant in the room that we're not addressing, which is the social contract that's in place uh, between the ruler and, and the people. So. It's, it's a huge priority, and I agree with it, to, to keep people satisfied and happy. So it, uh, the matter of actually uh, increasing productivity is not a matter maybe of cutting wages or, or, or disciplining. It's rather a matter of policy and incentivization. So what we saw happen in Qatar was with the, with the massive increase in wages, productivity actually increased because education was increasing at the same time. People understood that it was our duty to contribute. That, uh, that the country depends on us. There's, there was this outrage amongst uh, uh, the youth uh, very recently in a paper that was written that, that said, why are we employing foreigners when we can do the job? Especially on high technical levels. We can do the job. And there was this shift that happened dramatically because we are significantly more educated than our, than our parents. Um, also with regards to inflation, uh, inflation rates, this is, I mean, this is a purely econometric matter, and, and, and economists like to play with numbers, but, you know, sometimes they're, they're valid, but you don't know how true they are. Uh, uh, when, you, when you see um, the inflation rates in Qatar and oil price, they're actually negative. The correlation is negative, uh, simply because of long-term gas contracts. The same applies for the UAE, because they've diversified the economy. So policies cannot be unified throughout the GCC. This is why we fail to unify them uh, throughout our history. We can't get together and, and, and unify them. My, my father was born in 1948, right? And, and he was born, his father was a pearl diver, much like uh, most everyone else in the country. So what would happen is they would go out on these boats and they would dive for pearls. And uh, it, was, it was extremely dangerous because every time they would leave, the stories I heard was the family would cry because there was, a, there was, you know, there was a chance that they wouldn't come back. And the whole economy depended just on that, pearls. And then the Japanese come along and they make these you know, synthetic pearls and the economy crashes. And really, we still, so these, these purple dots that you see are blue dots are the pearl diving areas in which uh, my grandfather used to dive. And really, there's not much difference between that time and today because today, that is where our north field is. We depend on the same area. We're still diving for a commodity that, that is out of our control. That dot that you see to the west in Qatar is Khan field, which is the first oil field that we ever had. And, but the economy is based up there. So really, what's the difference? What, what have we done that's different? That just happens to cost more now. Um, I also got a, I, I, I met a few of you before the talk and uh, I ran out of cards, so my details are up there. Please feel free to <laughs> note them down. But I wanted to make this point because this discussion is, is, is based on this. The whole region depended <coughs> on a single commodity. That's what we've done for our history. Uh, and, and today it's no different. This is why Qatar has taken these, these fiscal reforms. We were lucky to have a very young leader in place. Saudi Arabia also has a very young uh, uh, leader in, in, in Mohammed bin Salman, and that's why you see these policies being pushed. I don't think it's, it has much to do with urgency, but rather the fact that we are more educated. Thank you. Well, as promised, we've left half an hour for a discussion. So if you'd like to ask a question to the panel, if you would just introduce yourself. There's microphones in the room, um, and uh, your affiliation, if you have one, if you'd like to share with us. We have one way in the back there. Uh, given what you said, how does a potential expansion of uh, LNG expert capacity in Qatar fit into this, this vision? Is it to, to recapture um, the market, or is it just to pursue opportunities that Australians and Americans are trying to grab? 
Okay, so so the gas market is is incomparable to the crude market for two reasons. One is that uh, the crude market is has has existed for much longer. Also, there is no single gas pricing mechanism <coughs> that is unified. So we don't have a Brent price or a WTI price for gas. So the expansion of the moratorium, I'm assuming that you're you're discussing in the North Field, was just a matter of of um, four hundred thousand equivalent of barrels of energy uh, as, as revenue. I mean, the, the field also, uh, we've been criticized a lot for, for this, and, and usually we get this criticism from uh, experts outside the field of, of energy. The moratorium increases in the south of that, that uh, circle, you see that big one. Uh, and even if it were all the way up to the north of our borders, it doesn't infringe on what is South Pars, uh, the Persian uh, <coughs> sector of that. The, the market, the gas market is controlled by long-term contracts. It's why Qatar has a fiscal buffer against oil price uh, decline. So no, there is, there is, <coughs> it's not market control. It has nothing to do with, uh, it's just extra revenue. Uh, we have another here on the, my left side. Hi, uh, my name is Adam Goltz. I'm from the U.S. Department of Treasury. Um, this is a question for Hassan. Um, how confident are you that uh, Saudi Arabia will be able to liberalize uh, electricity prices this year as outlined in uh, the fiscal balance program? Thanks. Thank you for the question. Very confident. Uh, uh, last week, last Monday, the government announced the creation of the uh, principal buyer uh, company, and this is, uh, this is necessary also for to, uh, to uh, complete uh, the various uh, uh, links in the chain of, uh, of uh, privatization, particularly for uh, uh, the uh, electricity generation. Uh, what we have in Saudi Arabia, as I'm pretty sure that most of, of you are following, uh, there's uh, what's called the reference price, which is our version of the international <laughs> price for for the commodity, and it'll be uh, it'll be reached uh, and between now and 2020, the end of 2020. So, uh, but the the implied part of your question, if I understood you correctly, that you know some of these reforms will the government will not press on, but that's that's not the case. There is no, uh, uh, as Karen said, uh, softening. There is no softening, but the the basic idea that. Uh, oil prices improved. The uh, fiscal consolidation uh, also proved uh, uh, to be uh, effective. Hence, you have more revenues, and then uh, you, uh, you give back some of the money. Uh, in the original announcement, it was said that these cuts are temporary, so they are. And for the, there is also another uh, element, which is the annual increment for uh, public or civic employees. Uh, that was uh, held for one year, and that year will end in Shaban. So uh, that's, but the issue of, of uh, going to market in electricity and other commodities is there. It's uh, like one of the main pillars for the privatization program. And also, you have to remember now, in, in, to mitigate to various risks, <laughs> there was a very important uh, element created, which is the citizen account, whereby uh, cash transfers will be deposited. Yes. Um, <clears throat> can I ask one little follow-up as the moderator's <laughs> um, prerogative? What do you think about the potential for the GCC to share electricity and sell to one another using the existing grid system? Uh, they will do that eventually. Uh, as I told you, and as you, as you mentioned in the, in the introduction, uh, I spent most of the 90s working for an organi organization called the Gulf Organization for Industrial Consulting. And one of the projects that I was personally involved, heavily involved in, was the gas grid in the GCC. Mm -hmm. The GCC gas grid. But every other country said, we don't need gas, we're okay. Okay, I thought, well, we have a very good opportunity with 
you know, the Qataris that they have, you know, abundance of gas and it's there and using the prox proximity. But it seems to me now that the six GCC states do realize that they have to plan and do realize that they have to realize the plans also and the long term divisions. It seems to me, with time, they will converge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the the uh, the, uh, the economic, the fiscal policies will will converge, but we need more time. It seems to me, early on, we had so many, uh, so much money to the extent that we 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 thought at the time that we don't have to be very efficient. Okay, it's okay if we do it our way and we lose a couple of billions. Now I don't think we we can afford doing that. So will the meaning that the economic uh, reasoning will prevail within the, uh, within the, uh, uh, the six GCC states. Thank you. Okay, we have um, a few here. So on the left, and then the lady here in the second row. I'm Riyaz Naqshbandi from Kogad School of Business at American University. Actually, I have a very quick uh, comment, and then I will ask a quick question as well, 60 seconds. When we talk about economic reform, unfortunately, we focus on, on employment and what, what have you. But sometimes we forget the fact that even the way you receive visitors into your country is part of economic reform because it will attract attention. Just a visitor to Doha, you will find that magnificent airport, that magnificent service that you will get. My question is about uh, the switching gears, Dr. Hassan. We switched the gears in terms of partnership between the investors and the government for more than 20 years. And we have something called offset programs in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and what have you. But the, the problem with these offset programs is implementation. So I'd like, like to hear from you some comments concerning what is new about switching gears in terms of the cooperation between the country in question and the investors. And um, let's go ahead and take the second question, and then uh, you can respond. Good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Segera. I'm the president of Segera's International Group. Thank you so much for your presentation. I've been to Saudi Arabia, and recently I had met to meet with the governor and the minister for finance of uh, Qatar at the World Bank IMF meetings. Uh, Qatar has a very good program. I'm following what you said about education. Qatar has a very good program for SMEs, small and medium businesses, uh, which they incubate them. So I think education to small and medium businesses in countries would be very great to the countries to help them and into innovation and manufacturing. As you said, the young people say, we are here specialized. We don't have jobs. They are there. But when you have this small and medium, they can intern with them, work with them. So I still intend and want to come to Qatar and see the innovation for small and medium because that's what my focus is. So what, is, what do you manufacture? Thank what you. Saudi manufacture? Thank so we've got a question about offsets and what, why, why is this time different, and a question uh, more on vocational training and uh, partnering for um, job creation in manufacturing. Well, uh, thank you for the question. The offset, uh, everyone had uh, high hopes for the offset program at the time. But it, it, pro uh, it proved to be a, a big disappointment, at least from my own estimation. Uh, I'm a member of the, uh, the Saudi-British uh, Joint Business Council, and all the time we dwell with our uh, friends, the Brit uh, friends, the British, on the offset, uh, and they have to do more and all this. But now things are, are also different. You see, uh, the, the issue now that even when it comes to uh, uh, security and defense contracts. No offset, but they have to do local content. Meaning if you have, like you are the British, and you have a contract of 100, uh, of, uh, say 100 billion, okay, uh, then okay, there is no contract if you are not going to do local content within the country. Okay, and that's, that's very clear. Uh, so that, that's the, like say, the new rule now. And, that, and we have to understand also that we have a very uh, uh, impressive local content program going on for a number of years with Aramco. 
which also humongous, which uh, the, the, the annual uh, invoicing of that is about 10 billion Saudi riyals and 100 billion Saudi riyals uh, annually for Aramco. And they are expanding that to be national. So things are, are changing. Right now, for example, if you visit Riyadh, new airport, Terminal 5, or even the, any, any other airport, you'll see now uh, you don't have people in uniform but in thobes, and they will smile to you. Things are changing. And the prince's uh, interview, what he said, he said, well, our brothers in, in Qatar and Emirates ahead of us, talking about aviation now, okay? And we have to do more. We, don't ha we did not have a strategy. So very clear, we, you know, this is a weakness, and we have to do something about it. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comments. I, I was, we, were in, um, we were in Kenya last week, right? And the same question was asked. And then um, the, I'll give you the answer that the CEO of the Qatar Development Bank gave. So Qatar Development Bank is the bank that uh, incubates these projects and, and funds them. And, and so the, the mission here is not uh, to, to employ, because the latest statistic I read, which was maybe two years ago, says that there are 65 or 70,000 people, locals, that are employed in Qatar. That's it. 70,000 people. That's, that's everyone. That includes people like my father who are retired and they receive, you know, salaries. So, so it's not a matter of, of, you know, increasing employment or, or it's just a matter of diversifying the economy. Um, this bank actually has a section called the International Relations Department that uh, goes out, takes your project, if you're manufacturing something, there was, there was one project that was an aluminum uh, plant in Qatar. They will go to economies that need it and sign memorandums of understanding that help this private sector aluminium exporter to export. Uh, Qatar's GDP as of late was, the non-hydrocarbon sector of Qatar's GDP was 37.9%. I think that's the highest in the region, uh, followed by uh, the UAE at 34% or something like that. So, so the point here is not employment or, or it's empowerment and it, and it goes hand in hand with this fact that we have an educated youth, let them produce. Yeah, Omar. Uh, just a <coughs> brief addition. So um, uh, uh, th there are best practices based on global experience on how to support SMEs. Uh, having the best, the, the ideal support is not through um, having giving civil servants funds which they then uh, disperse to projects they think are good, mm -hmm. um, no matter how well intentioned those civil servants are. The 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 uh, and. And this is something that's reflected in the vision twenty in the visions. A, a preferable way of doing it is uh, lifting fees that SMEs face, uh, helping banks by private finance by giving them, for example, loan guarantees. These kind of things are far more effective ways of generating effective SM uh, of, you know, productive SMEs than giving funds to some sort of uh, uh, government organ, which then has to work out what is a good project and what is a bad project. Um, so, you know, development banks are not the worst thing in the world, but far better is lifting the fees that small firms face. So, you know, for example, in Saudi Arabia, if it wants to grow its SMEs now, there's a, li cutting fees is going to be far better than, uh, than, than uh, having, you know, uh, uh, as I say, an organization try pick winners. May I um, add one more mm -hmm. comment? Sure. So th th I'd, I'd like to outline the process very quickly of how this works. And this, this goes, this ranges from I want to open a cafe to I want to export um, polyethylene. It goes the whole range. So if you have an idea, you go to this bank and they'll listen to your idea and that's it and they take it from there. They'll do your feasibility study. They will employ people to, to look at your finances. They will guarantee your loan to the bank. This, is, this incentive I think is unprecedented. I haven't heard of anything like it. Where you're really investing in the intelligence of your people. You're not investing in, in, in um, you know, in, in some, some policy that has been done and you're copying it. This is, this is a direct investment in intelligence. And it's a huge amount of money, so the risk is huge, especially now. So, so it's, it's one thing I'm very proud of that, that we do in, in Qatar. 
One might argue it's another form of, of redistribution, right? Very similar to what's... Well, let me... Yeah. So, so this, is, this is happening in parallel with um, the increase at pump prices. Mm. Um, we're expecting that they'll increase again within 2017 another three times until we hit market price. Uh, this is also happening during a time where yesterday uh, the, the taxation policy was rewritten in Doha. So, so this, is, this is... I would disagree with the, the, you know, the wealth distribution theory, especially when it comes to QDB, because it's happening in parallel with policies that are actually cutting wealth mm -hmm. and cutting you know, the, the average Qatari's propensity to consume. So hand up, not hand out. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a direct, there's no better way to describe it. It's a direct trust and investment in, in the people. Isan, you had a comment? Yes, uh, two things. One, uh, regarding uh, employment, you see, for different uh, GCC states, it's also different, you know, the, well, you know how to handle the uh, the job market. Uh, to some GCC states, job creation is not an issue, really. Uh, to us in Saudi Arabia, it, it is, is an yeah. issue. It's a very big issue. It is the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, in Saudi Arabia, we have about, uh, as of uh, the latest, about a million uh, citizens uh, looking for jobs. The vast majority of them are graduated with BS mm -hmm. degrees, mm -hmm. about uh, 59 percent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, and to just demonstrate the point that it is an issue, you know, for job creation and, you know, employment, and the 10 programs that were announced lately, like on Sunday, one of the KBIs for them, each of them, is employment, job creation. So there's a target for each of them, and to check if that target is being achieved or not. Second, one of these programs has to do with in, with uh, entrepreneurship and uh, to encourage more Saudis. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, to, to, to the issue of small and medium, we feel in Saudi Arabia it's not only financing, but in addition to that, the, the linkages, it's an economic issue, it's a policy issue, meaning that what you have, you have an all-encompassing businesses that are big enough to take all the, all the to, to eat up all the buy, mm -hmm. and then you have the small and medium, and you have to uh, uh, enable them to, to, to be there, so this is what's happening. And this, by the way, initiative is, is very big. They're counting that through this, we'll, we'll achieve two goals. One of them will... Uh, uh, empower the, the young to uh, be self-employed. But second, will uh, uh, combat the black economy that uh, Dr. Abedli mentioned uh, briefly, which represents uh, about 21% of the Saudi economy. It's a humongous. Uh, it re me the meaning that this re it represents about, the, the worth of it uh, would be uh, about 500 billion. Uh, you know, of, of the of the say the uh, the the private sector, which uh, uh, comprises uh, about forty percent of the GDP. So uh, now, the when we are talking, that's why when we're talking about reforms, we are also talking about re reforming the private sector and how the business is is, is being done, and make, making sure that the whole. Uh, uh, spectrum of the citizens and the country in, in inhabitants in, in the country will benefit from from that rather than you know I will just uh, uh, I came early on so I, I'll seize all opportunities and they are mine and my children and my grandchildren thank you any more questions from the audience okay good we have three we'll start with you here and then two more on the on the right side let's take all three questions and then we'll respond just to keep things moving Joshua Hodge, I'm a graduate student at American University. What education and uh, social reforms are being made in Qatar to uh, encourage students to go into diverse private sector industries? Okay, that's one. We'll take two more on this side. Hi, I'm Dr. Shea Garrison with Vital Voices Global Partnership. And I wanted to address my question to Fahad and Omar. Um, I recently did research, quantitative and qualitative, 
on the citizen labor market in Kuwait to find out what the major obstacles to labor force participation were. And Fahad brought up the elephant in the room or I would not have even asked this question. Um, I went over there as an economist uh, expecting to focus on economic and political obstacles. And what I found <laughs> coming from so many of my interviews, over 56, were that the social obstacles were heavily on the minds of the Kuwaiti people who were interested in private sector development. And you had mentioned um, lack of uh, supply of uh, citizen labor um, because of the low wages in the private sector. But I also found that there is a lack of supply because the menial jobs and the service jobs um, that are perceived there, um, there is also, was also a great lack of demand for citizen labor um, because of the wages that were expected but because of, and this is the elephant in the room, the sense of entitlement that Kuwaitis themselves perceived other Kuwaitis to have um, and not wanting to hire them in, in certain positions. And so I was just curious if you found this in other GCC countries as well, and if so, what you would uh, suggest for reform in those areas. Thank you. One more question, yeah. Abdulaziz al a lawyer from uh, Saudi. Um, I have to agree with Fahad uh, that we have uh, more sophisticated youth. Uh, from my experience in the private sector in the last 15 years, uh, I have seen uh, many Saudis who are committed, who are uh, highly qualified, and uh, there is a huge discrimination against them uh, uh, due to the control of uh, different non-locals in the private sectors historically and uh, I also add to my um, fellow about uh, uh, some of the Saudi businessmen were reluctant uh, to hire Saudis. Uh, uh, so for example the, the, the system which was brought by, um, by Aramco um, 40 or 50 years ago uh, where there is uh, different salaries for different citizenship if you have U.S. citizenship, you have this salary, U.K. this salary, uh, Saudi this salary, Arab this salary, other. So this kind of discrimination against Saudis and against also other cities, other uh, nationals from different jurisdictions have uh, affected the private sectors uh, a lot, and it's, it's not fair competitions. So uh, my question is to Dr. Ahsan, uh, do you think... Uh, there is some initiatives to, to, to resolve this issue uh, for employment because we still have a 10 million. And it's also not fair for this 10 million to be, uh, you know, their contracts, they have contracts for two years, four years. They have to complete their contracts. Uh, also, you didn't have kind of, you know, uh, you, st you didn't have kind of citizenship. You have to give them citizenship. They have spent 10 years or 15 years in the country. So I think we have a big issue. I didn't think so the Minister of Labor by itself could resolve it. I think the 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 whole cabinet has uh, to, uh, to go uh, about it. My last question is about do, is there a possibility actually with economic reform without political reform? Because we are not Singapore. Uh, our monarchies are uh, corrupted more or less like the others. So uh, without uh, transparency and accountability to the top, we cannot ask the, the, the people in the bottom to sacrifice. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have three um, useful questions. Who would like to answer first? Go ahead. <coughs> uh, so in res first of all, this, I, this, the question about meniality of jobs. Um, so I'm going to make a comment which sounds uh, bizarre at first, um, but bear with me. GCC people are actually, I would say, the toughest people on earth, um, historically. Uh, Fahad mentioned what his grandfather did. If anybody actually reads what a pearl diver does, it's probably one of the worst jobs, you know, in the history of mankind. It is, and this is what, and it, you know, uh, our uh, GCC citizens have been living in the t desert climate is tougher than even a Chandra climate or a, 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 an Arctic climate in terms of living. So up until the 70s, people in the GCC are used to living doing the worst jobs and living in, in the most uh, conservative, uh, econo econ economically conservative way possible and living with very, very, very limited resources. Uh, and that's what we've been entire lives. From the 70s, there's been a, a, a sort of an oil boom and so people picked up some bad habits 
But just as they can pick up those bad habits, I can assure you they can lose them very quickly because our because our uh, our, our history is that our culture is is putting up with the, with the toughest climate in the world and having no other resources um, to to work with. In terms of the uh, 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 social contract, I don't think the social contract actually is a, is a critical part because the social contract that people do predates oil, yeah. um, and it's not as if. You know, pearl divers uh, were, you know, were asking for cushy government jobs or something like this. I think it's mostly an economic thing. I didn't say that private sector wages are low. Yeah. I said public sector wages are high. Private sector wages are commensurate. People who are productive in the private sector in GCC get paid very high wages. If we go to the financial sector, people who make who are who make money for their organisations get paid well, like they do in any other place in the world. The 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 the, the distortion is coming from the public sector where you have. Uh, and this is particularly acute in Kuwait. It's, it's good that you started that. I would say probably Kuwait is the worst country in the GCC in terms of having large numbers of people in the, in the public sector working. I, mean, I think some of them don't even show up to work. Uh, uh, the wages there, the, the jobs are guaranteed, but essentially anyone who wants to get a job almost can. Maybe that's changed in the last couple of years. But it's a huge distortion. So it's not that the private sector wages need to be raised. Just if you want a viable reform, cut the public sector wages, scale back the public sector hiring. There's ways of doing that that are more, you know, that are, that are less shock and awe. Uh, um, but, uh, but ironically, you know, the biggest, uh, the biggest thing going in favor of that is the, the uh, instability that, that, that's present in the entire Middle East. It's not as if there's, you know, there's wonderful alternative economic models in the, in, in the Middle East that people are adopting and that the GCC countries are not. Uh, uh, I think people, uh, will moan, will grumble, but they'll swallow it because because what we have in the GCC, even if you got your wage cut by 20, 30 percent, like the people in Saudi Arabia recently did, it's still a lot better than than the alternative. And that's not just an artifact of, of oil, because there's plenty of countries in the Middle East that have a lot of oil, uh, even more than the ones in the GCC that don't uh, provide these uh, 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 comfortable lives to their citizens. So I think that uh, it's a mostly economic issue and it all comes from high public sector wages. You deal with that, everything else will sort itself out. I have to interject, Omar. So I, I wish we had a Kuwaiti expert because they might take issue with your <laughs> your point. Um, but also I think the question was really more about service sector. And there we, we have to acknowledge that salaries are very, very low. Um, in service sector and in uh, low wage uh, sort of uh, construction workers, for example. Well, construction, um, I mean, let, let's take service sector. Even the last 10 years, I, I go to the Eastern Province regularly, so that, that service sector jobs were not taken by Saudis and now they're taking them. Uh, in, in Bahrain, people work in McDonald's, Bahraini citizens, people work all sorts of service sector, they work as sales assistants, they do all the jobs. It's, uh, yeah, some, some of them have particular wages, but this is, this is not the barrier. Uh, there are some, even, even if you, even if you uh, said we're only going to give job, people are still, we're not going to change the cultural standards. If you just, the reason people are not taking these jobs essentially is because they have a preconceived alternative of the public sector job, which is high paying and low effort. You get that, you get rid of that option and people will be willing to do these other jobs for, and, uh, for, for those wages. I'm, I'm very confident of that. And I see it with my eyes, I see it in Saudi Arabia. People, mm. when I used to go to the malls 10 years ago, they were staffed by foreigners. Now they're staffed by Saudi Arabians. And it's not because there's been some huge increase in, in okay. service sector wages in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Uh, yeah. Fahad and Nissan want to comment as well. Please. Oh. Well, the, I'm, I'm, I'm a very, when it comes to the GCC, and you compare the countries, the six countries were different because we have different resources and because our economies are different. But if you are from the GCC, I guarantee you I will find a way that I'm related to you. No doubt. Really? So, so, so uh, the, you cannot, the, the Kuwaiti situation and the, and the Qatari situation, the Bahraini situation, they're different because of economic reasons. They're not different because the people are different. So even if a Kuwaiti was sitting here, I doubt you would take much issue with with Omar's comment. Right, yeah. we, we are, we're named differently because, uh, you know, a long time ago, people drew lines and now we have borders. So the, the, what happened in Qatar and the reason we have become significantly more productive is because when this new leadership came in, uh, he gave a speech, the Emir gave a speech and he said, the country deserves more mm -hmm. than what you're giving it. We carried you, we educated you, we fed you, you're, you're living good lives, you're all very, very well off, and you're not giving back. And it was very blunt and it was on TV and that's literally what he said. And so it was a wake-up call. And now even in management, when, when, when you're talking about people that are not as young as the people that uh, recently entered the job market, 
there's more awareness. There's, there's not only incentivization, there's also punishment and discipline uh, in the workforce. The sense of entitlement will disappear with time. It has to. There's no way it can last. But you're talking about very, very, very young countries that are populated with very, very young people. So a sense of entitlement, yes, it exists. No one can deny it, but it will fade. Also, I don't think um, anyone answered your question with regards to education and, and private sector. I come from the energy sector. So, but what I can tell you is that it is a myth, as, as Omar said, that, that private sector wages are, are low. They're actually higher in Doha, usually. When you talk uh, oil and gas, when you talk financial, they're much higher. Um, so what happens is the cream of the crop, the, the good students go private, and then the not so good students go government. But they're all guaranteed a job. Isan, you're going to have the last word. I oh, thank you very much. You see, uh, still, uh, uh, there are uh, differences in policies. Uh, and uh, to say that the uh, that the salaries of the of the of the government uh, in GCC are much higher. This is like uh, like a sweeping remark in general. In general, maybe by and large in certain countries, but in Saudi Arabia that's not the case. The a salary of, of a minister in Saudi Arabia is forty five uh, what? Yeah. Forty five thousand. Forty five thousand Saudi rials per month. You know, I mean, I mean, a month or. So it's not high. Uh, in the private sector, yes, in private sector, you'll find much higher salaries. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue has to do with policies, uh, like you know, for uh, for uh, expats, historical policies for expats to come into the country and work, and many of them were interested interested not to work for a salary but to be entrepreneurs, but you know, concealed entrepreneurs, and that's that's the percentage, the twenty. The 21 percent of the GDP that I spoke, uh, spoke uh, or mentioned earlier. Uh, what we are trying to do in Saudi Arabia regarding this uh, is uh, to ha to do this uh, discreetly, uh, in, in a sense, not to impact, as the the, uh, the question was, not to impact the, the 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 economy, the job market, and the economy. So, for example, one of the policies that will be triggered. Uh, in the second half of this year is uh, additional uh, uh, levies for, for uh, expats and their dependents. So they have to put, mm -hmm. ma meaning ma making the, 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 uh, the, the employing uh, 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 an expat more expensive. Uh, my last point, uh, to very briefly, uh, mundane jobs or uh, New jobs. We've done a survey <coughs> in Juwatha for a, a very big client regarding this, and the question was: Would Saudis accept uh, mundane jobs? That was the question, and we conducted a survey and then analysis and all this, and the answer was: For the right salary, and if it's not haram, I will do the job because that's that's fine. So, uh, actually, sometimes we have you know conceptions. The last, the last uh, uh, point regarding uh, corruption, and if you have corruption, then you don't have development, and you'll have issues, social problems, and so on and so and so forth. Uh, uh, last week, we uh, we witnessed a first in Saudi Arabia uh, by uh, reaching a, a minister, and b because of uh, wrongdoing, and okay, that's that's one. Second, in the interview of, of the prince, uh, it was very clear that he said, you know, with corruption, we cannot go further. So, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll, no, no, no exemptions for a prince or for a minister or for whomever, and this, this is only the beginning. And that's, I think, that's, that's, that's the case. And in order to have a, a, a firm uh, belief in, 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 the in the future, we have... Uh, also to support that uh, policy uh, all in all. Thank you. Thank you. I know Marcel wants to say a word, but just uh, I'd like to thank the panelists. I think it, this GCC delegation is an indication of uh, punctuality. We've uh, stuck to our time. 
of uh, really in-depth knowledge of the issues. I think we've gotten to some granular levels here, and I really appreciate your willingness to, to speak and to speak frankly. And these are three very knowledgeable um, experts, uh, and I just uh, can't thank you enough for being with us today. Thank you. Marcel? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> actually, actually, I wanted to take a special moment because I think this is one of the best panels we've had. And on this particular issue, which is an issue that concerns all of the GCC countries. So I wanted to say a very special thank you to the panel for not only representing your individual countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Bahrain, but also for giving our audience a really good view on what's going on in the region. And I appreciate your candor and your knowledge. So thank you very much. And to Karen for an outstanding moderating job. Thank you all. <laughs>